Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. How you doing, Bruce? I'm all right tonight, David. How about yourself? Well, the tr- I'm a little down on the dumps, Bruce. I made the mistake of listening to the uh, Flannery O'Connor audiobook. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if you know that writer, but man, it was one dep- <laughs> it was one depressing audiobook. It was, she's kind of like the Herbert Selby Jr. of the South, I think, in terms mm-hmm. of writing about depressing stories. So if you ever get a chance to read a, uh, or listen to a book by Flannery O'Connor, Bruce, I'll just give it a pass. That's my yeah. advice to you. Okay. Enough depressing stuff out there in the world without going out of my way. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> okay. Um, back on track with tonight's uh, game. Uh, 4-2 Oilers victory over the Flames of Calgary. Bruce, it was a weird game. The Oilers got up by two and kind of coughed up the lead. It, it seemed to me like the Oilers were a little cavalier. Like they felt when they needed to win the game, they could win the game against this team. And, and they were right. Proving, again, this is a team... They can turn it off and on, and um, they did so tonight, I think. What was your take on it? Yeah, it wasn't a very focused effort, I didn't think. Uh, There was uh, lots of sloppy hockey, uh, some poor decision-making, which you'll get into in a bit. Um, There was uh, lots of D-zone turnovers or failures to clear the puck or make clean plays with the puck uh, in the uh, defensive zone. I thought that actually got a little better late in the late in the game when they finally tried to nurse home the 3-2 lead. They started making some plays in the defensive end, but it was not a, uh, a real clean win. They got fairly heavily outshot, and the penalty kill had a couple of fails, and Thankfully, Calvin Pickard, uh, who is anything but an orthodox NHL goalie, had just enough saves in his pocket. Uh, stopped 34 of 36 or 33 of 35. I'm not sure if they've decided on which is the correct number yet because I'm seeing both. But uh, either way, when uh, when you're letting in, uh, uh, you're getting... Uh, that many shots and you're holding the other guys to two, you're doing something right, even as his uh, his style he's me a little cold at times. We had him with um thirteen forty three. We had him with um flames with thirteen grade A shots and the orders with twelve. And the subset of five alarm shots was four to two. Oh, wasn't it cool. wasn't a very thrilling game in a, I don't know it was an okay game but I, like the announcers made it sound more thrilling than it was I didn't find mm-hmm. it a very good game like a lot of the order's best players like McDavid hardly got going this game mm-hmm. the, the entire game and anyway um Bruce this is our t- two good things two bad things and two numbers podcast with one conundrum what's your good thing yeah I'm going to go back to uh, good old Connor Brown who I thought had a pretty fine game tonight. In fact, I thought his whole line had a pretty fine game again with uh, uh, Derek Ryan and Matthias Janmark. And they dominated on the shot clock. Uh, Once again, carrying play and giving up nothing. Uh, Just for a second, Janmark, second night in a row that the other guys didn't get a single shot on net while he was on the ice, five to zero for the Oilers, two games in a row for Matthias Janmar. In the case of Connor Brown, that count was seven for the Oilers and one against. And this is a night where uh, five on five shots were 18 for the Oilers and 29 against. So when the, when Brown was on the bench, it was 11 to 28. And when he was on the ice, it was seven to one. I'd say he probably played pretty well. And my eyes say, I mean, just from those numbers, but when I say the same thing, uh, he did score the game's lone five-on-five tally with uh, each team scoring two power play goals and uh, Edmonton getting the empty netter. 
And the five on five that briefly gave him a two nothing lead uh, was Brown uh, following up a play which she had been involved in in the defensive zone. And then uh, Janmark and Ryan kind of broke away on a, on a quasi two on one and they kind of slopped the puck around and didn't really get a direct shot. And then uh, Brown came in late and Janmark chipped it over to him and Brown hacked it into the corner of the net for uh, the goal. And not the cleanest, but it went up on the board and uh, he very, very nearly got another one uh, late in the game when uh, he again broke in uh, two on one with dry saddle and Leon sent a wonderful saucer pass over and Brown did not miss. He got it up and into the top half of the net. Yeah, nice and play. Markstrom did very, very well to stay high enough to get his shoulder on that shot and somehow keep it out like he didn't really control it but it was you know he he made the stop and brown on the night he had uh three shots off his own stick and he and janmark were clean on the penalty kill ryan not so much but they uh, brown played two and a quarter minutes on the penalty against a very hot calgary power play and they did well and in fact they had to puck up the ice a, uh, a fair bit of the time uh, when he and Yanmar were penalty killing. So those two guys, and Ryan just a little less because his penalty kill unit with Nugent Hopkins mm-hmm. got beaten for two goals. Yeah. So, but uh, uh, Brown, Brown with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Yanmar, uh, re- really both of them deserve a stick tap for uh, being a good thing in what was a pretty sloppy game by Edmonton. They played a good, sharp, professional game. Yeah, I thought, um, you know, we talked recently as a conundrum whether Connor Brown should play higher up the lineup. And by the end of the game, I understand that he, like, I, yeah. I they, they switched up the lines. I wasn't, I was kind of, like, I was busy writing the game grades and um, I wasn't really tuned into exactly what the lines were because it was kind of a chaotic game. There was lots of, there was power plays and, but uh, Brown did get moved up. He now has four goals. Yanmark has four goals. Mm-hmm. Ryan has five. Um, so none of them have been um, lighting the lamp regularly this year. But Bruce, you know, um, I wrote a recent post about the most underrated oiler, and Yanmark was on my list as a possibility because I think he really is underrated. He's a, he's mm-hmm. a very effective two-way hockey player. He hardly gives. He's their best defensive winger by by some amount, and um, he's he's just he's. Good with the puck, strong with the puck. He makes good decisions. On the on the um, uh, empty net goal, he was in the corner, you know, battling hard and helping pop that puck out to get the, it going in the right dire- direction. Yanmark was mm-hmm. so. Yep. Um, he's he's a good player. I want to give a speaking of stick taps on the on that rush where Dry Settle set up Connor Brown. Yeah, Adam Henrique made a really fine uh, back check and mm-hmm. got that play going in the right direction. Um, on that play, so you know the Oilers, they have enough talent to win a game like this, and and this group, this trio is part of it. They're a good group of players. In the third period, it was Brown moved up to play with Drysaddle and Nugent Hopkins. Okay, and uh, it was pretty clear that um, uh, Knobloch wasn't real happy with the performance of any of his lines, and he so he put Henrique up on the first line with. Uh, McDavid and Hyman, and uh, moved up Brown to play with Drysaddle and Nuge, and uh, I think the McLeod Perry Kane line uh, stayed together, even though it looked like they were uh, possibly going to take a you know a legal separation on the bench there late in the second period. <laughs> That's a good idea to have Corey Perry there with uh, Evander Kane to tune them in now and then, I think. Although they both needed some tuning in. (laughs) Yeah, there was a lot of snarkiness going on there. Yeah, that's okay. And and, uh, they started the third period, and they were technically sitting next to each other on the bench because there was nobody in between them. But there was about a foot and a half of room in between. It wasn't this shoulder-to-shoulder, right, you know, side by each. And there was room enough for Glenn Gulitson to stick his head in there and get in the ears of both of them. And I don't know what the hell that was about. I, 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 uh, 
I'll credit any reporter who has the courage to ask either of those guys what was going on there. <laughs> but I sure would like to know. It was gnarly and gnarly. Bizarre. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Bruce, my uh my good thing, and it, it might be the first time this year, Vincent De DeHarnay is my good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the marks of uh defenseman getting the job done in a game is if he doesn't make any mistakes on a grade a shot against if you can get through a game as a defenseman and you've done that you have you have done your job fundamentally and you have done it you have done well in a hockey game you know even the best defensemen tend to average about one mistake per game on a grade a shot like adam larson did that a few years ago which was pretty remarkable uh you know most of them around 1.5 um, yeah. Major mistakes on grade A shots per game. Deharnay none. He kept a clean yeah. sheet at even strength this game. So and on the penalty kill, um, and he so he was solid all game long. There was one play. Um, I think it's in the second. Kulak bobbles or steps on the puck, or like he just he fumbles the puck, and there's a two on run rush. Yeah. And all year long, the owners have been rather famous, I think, for getting scored on on two-on-one rushes. And it's often the same. The, the reason is they don't know how to cover off the, um, the danger man, the guy without the puck. Because if he can get the pass and shoot, he's he's more likely to score. And the owners just, their defensemen are, I think, relatively inept as a group at stopping that play. They're not very good at it. But um, DeHarnay just... I just thought it was perfect. He just faded towards. He, it's the idea is let the shooter go in and shoot. The goalie will make that save because usually it's from the top of the circles. Because if he goes any closer than that, it gets a little tough, and the defenseman can then make a play on the shooter. But DeHarnay, um, he just faded over to the shooter, took that took that pass away completely, and um, I can't remember who shot it. He he think he did hit the post, the outside of the post on the shot. But um, it was the right play and uh, no goal, which was a relief. Then in the final, the orders have a 3-2 lead and um, they're doing their best to give, give away the game at the end of the game. And there's two really, really good chances from the slot area. And Daharney blocked both. He, he broke up both those plays. He broke up one with a stick and he blocked the other. Or maybe he blocked both of them anyway. Just two really super solid plays in front of the net in crunch time late in the game, he was bearing down and he got the job done. That was a great game from Vincent DeHarnay. And um, if he can bring that game to the playoffs, and I'm starting to think he can, like, I, I don't like him out there, uh, you know, in the top four playing with Connor McDavid or dry saddle or the offensive players, the, 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 the play t does tend to end in the offensive zone, at least in that kind of one third zone game in the offensive end, he's their weakest defenseman on the orders. But in in the in his own zone, he may be the Boilers' best defenseman. Just in in the bottom third of the ice in the defensive zone, he's fantastic, and he was that way tonight. So uh, credit to him. Oh, I can't hear you, Bruce. Maybe that's I muted there. myself to cough, and then I forgot to unmute. There we go. Uh, he go. was he was in the box. On the 2-2 goal for a penalty, I honestly, there was a puck cleared out to the center line. A Calgary guy was coming at him, uh, and DeHarnay was strong on his stick and shot it back in. The Calgary guy dropped his stick on the ice. It wasn't even broken. And the ref decides that, what the hell did he call that anyway? Like, uh, slashing. Like he was playing the puck. <laughs> Put a stick on the puck and he shot it into the zone and they called him for slashing. I mean, these two minutes these for guys Jai tonight, there was junk both ways. Like, I'm not saying yeah. they changed the outcome of the game, but they certainly changed the flow of the game because there were so many power plays in this game. Uh, was it five each? Two uh, minutes two for, for six. Two for six. Both teams went two for six on the power play. There you go. And in about 14 minutes of... Uh, Odd man hockey. Anyway, it, uh, it saw it off in the end, both in terms of number of penalties and in terms of number of power play goals. But uh, there were some 
So <laughs> that was the softest of the soft to my eye. Like I looked at the replay. What did he do wrong? He won well, the you battle. Know, we know what he did wrong, Bruce. Two minutes two for minutes being, for being giant. too big. Yeah, two minutes for being too big. He gets that call all the time. Yeah, that was. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so I don't hold that particular one against him. There are other penalties that, you know, you have to you have to point fingers. But that one was just, I thought, a weak call. Okay. One of my sons is six seven, and he used to get that penalty in minor hockey quite a bit. Two mm-hmm. minutes for being the Stronger biggest guy on the, the ice. Guy. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was at the game tonight in Calgary. Actually, oh yeah, so, oh, good. Yeah, just thinking of. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, it exactly. Uh, grade A stuff for a lot of no, it, but there's, but there's see lots it. of passion going on out there. Like there, wow. there was, there's some, there's a real rivalry at least. He got to see the executioner shot live mm-hmm. going to the net from okay. Leon Dreisaitl. So that's always a thrilling moment for any Oilers fan. Yes, it is. Bruce, what's your bad thing? Yeah, it's got to be executioned by Oilers on breakaways. Edmonton has three clear-cut breakaways tonight. And out of the three clear-cut breakaways tonight, they generated zero shots on net. They couldn't even get a stinking shot away on any of the three. Fogel went in on a breakaway, tried to deke, fumbled his deke, shoveled it into the boards. Hyman went in on a breakaway, tried to deke, kind of fumbled his deke, shoveled it into the boards. And, and then, then the worst. McDavid the worst. and Hyman, 2 on oh. You got the guy leading the league in assists. You got a guy with 50 goals. And they go in on a 2 on oh, and it's pass, 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 miss pass, puck in the corner. <laughs> Nothing. Not even a shot. If uh, I if, mean, oh. come on. <laughs> Bruce, if McDavid had shot on that pass from Hyman, like he, the first pass went from McDavid to Hyman. Mm-hmm. McDavid to Hyman, and then Hyman put it back to McDavid. If McDavid had shot, he would have scored. Probably. Markstrom was way out of position. Like, he could have gone five-hole, or he could have gone top shelf. There was lots of net. To, but McDavid didn't even look to shoot. Yeah, he wanted he, Hyman to get it. He wanted to get the apple, I think. Maybe. I just, he's kind of, he's, he's, he, I don't know. Is he going for, like, the 100 assists or something? Or is he just unselfish? He just wants the other guy to score. Um, yeah. Maybe a bit of both. Well, yeah, that's mm-hmm. how you get to 100 assists. Yeah, he is an unselfish hockey player, Connor McDavid. Yeah. But man, it, if he had shot there, I think he would have scored. Yeah. I, and I'm not one to tell Connor McDavid what to do on the ice when it comes to attacking. So I'll just, I'll just shut up I'm about it. Tell him what to do. I'm just going to say three breakaways, zero shots on net. Tell you what not to do, and that's whatever it is you're trying to do because it ain't working. I thought Fogel came the, like he came close to scoring there. Like he he that was a good try, but I don't he's know. not a deeker. Probably not. His best play, you know, like he's not never been good on breakaways. But I've noticed before when he's tried to deke, he usually basically fumbles it. Yeah. Uh, whereas with the shot, at least he got it on net, and you know he got that fifteen percent chance. You know that it's going to beat the tendy, maybe twenty. You know, he's not going to score a lot of the time, but uh, you got to get the puck on the net if you want to score, guys. Three clear-cut breakaways. And my uh, bad thing is also three undisciplined penalties by veteran players, Corey Perry in the first, Evander Kane in the second, and Leon Dreisaitl in the third. And I'm going to single out Kane, Kane and Dreisaitl especially. Kane's came, the owners are up 2 nothing. The Flames are about to fold. Like, they've got nothing going on. Mm-hmm. And Kane gets pushed at the end of a rush into the towards the net, into the net. And he gets mad and he hacks the guy. He really hacked him. It was going to – you get you hack someone that hard, and you're a Vander Kane especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just penalty every time. Mm-hmm. That was just terrible because they just gave the Flames life. They scored on the power play. Instantly. Instantly, they just it just turned it changed the game from a cakewalk for the Oilers, an easy win, into a, ba- a game they had to battle hard the whole way, because he mm-hmm. he decided he's going to hack somebody. Ah, that is not a professional foul. Dry settle then late in the third on the power play, he gets. I mean, he got hacked pretty good himself, 
And then he really hacked the Calgary Flame player. So, of course, he Rasmus got a penalty. Sanderson, who was the hacker he, and the hacky on that Are play. you sure? I thought he got the wrong guy, actually. No, it was um, Anderson. Okay. So, um, but again, like, the, it's just a one-goal lead at that point. And yeah. um, you're going to give the other, you're going to take away your power, power power play. Not a great play. And you know what? If this happens in the playoffs, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a disaster. You just can't have it. You got to take it. And... Um, We'll see if they can turn that off. Like, I think they can actually, in terms of the like the, the um, intensity, the hitting, the defensive discipline, I think they can turn that off and on. I don't know about this, though, Bruce, this kind of short uh, fuse that some of these right. players have. All three cases. I'm Perry a little bit worried. Guy right after the yeah. whistle at the blue line as well. Yeah. The play was, was a dead play in the case of both Perry and Kane's penalties. Yeah. And maybe that's what they were arguing about, which one was the worst penalty. <laughs> they did not have a particularly good game either it, those guys it was you no, out of it was sorts you. two hotheads were, going out of sorts yeah they didn't well after their great game against the Avs three goals mm-hmm. uh, for that line and then yeah, yeah it was not good tonight at all that line was mm-hmm. weak you know the uh, you you pointed out the um, the checking line of Ryan Yanmark, Mark and Brown they didn't have one according to our tally they didn't have one great A shot against them like they didn't they were just, right. they were fantastic out there. Bruce, your numero. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, with uh, 40 and 100. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl scored his 40th goal of the season last night after getting his 100th point. No, tonight, sorry. After getting his 100th point of the season last night, he followed up with his 40th goal of the season on the executioner's shot. And he has uh, now taken over the lead among active players in, ter- in terms of he's the only guy in the league today who has five 40-goal seasons and five 100-point seasons. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Gregor was talking about that on, Friday, uh, on the show yesterday, Jason Gregor. And... Uh, uh, so I looked it up, and sure enough, there's you know dry saddle just underneath because he hadn't got to either milestone at that point. Uh, but he's done the the 45. Well, this is all five of five of the last six years. He fell short uh, the one ga- season that was only 56 games long. He only scored 31 goals and 84 points. So he was on pace for another you know 45. 120 kind of season that year so he's just been just such a consistent producer uh for the oilers and uh he now stands out in this sort of uh that's an ersatz category in a sense but uh, but in another sense those are real significant milestones 40 goal seasons and 100 point seasons are, are major marks for snipers and and point scorers generally and he's got the best combination of the those two skills i would argue of anyone in the league in terms of being able to do both things my number also relates to leon dry consistency and um for the last five seasons we've been um in in our grade a shots project we've been differentiating what kind of shots go in the net you know um whether it's a jam shot or a tip shot or a one-timer shot. So we have numbers for Leon Dreisaitl's executioner shots. Bruce, so in the last five years in the regular season, I'll give you the goal, how many goals he scored with the executioner shot each year, starting in 2019-20. He had 21 um, one-timers going that year. The next year, in 56 games, he had 18. The next year, 21 next year 17 this year 21 so three of the last five years he's at 21 who knows how many would have had in 2021 when he had just 18 his shooting percentage on the executioner shot his overall shooting percentage in those years has been each by season 32 percent 39 percent 37 percent 33 percent and 31 percent this year He's just, he's down a little bit this year. Overall, he's averaged 35%, and that includes the playoffs. Um, Bruce, this is the not only the most lethal 
weapon in hockey. It's also one of the steadiest. He's like Doc Holliday out there with his gun. Like he just, he is steady and deadly. And um, what a weapon, what a weapon. And I've said this many times before, I'll say it again. Year, decades from now, you know, if you're a young fan right now, decades from now, you won't remember, oh, unless you're Bruce McCurdy, I have a memory like Bruce McCurdy, you won't remember a whole heck of a lot about the McDavid era, but you will remember Connor McDavid rushing the puck. That that is that will be burned into your head, mm-hmm. just this image of him and how how he looked, how he moved. But you will also remember Leon Drysdale's executioner shot, and either McDavid or uh, Nugent Hopkins setting him up, and him firing it in. That's what I remember from the Gretzky era. Like I remember certain moments, lots mm-hmm. of moments. But what I really remember is Wayne Gretzky serpentining around the ice with the puck. And I remember Gretzky setting up Yari Curry. Finding Curry. Finding Curry for that one time. I mean, I also remember other things like Messier's wrist shot and Messier setting up Anderson with their spe- their seat, their sneaky play and Anderson crashing the net and Coffey moving with the ice. But it's those two things that stand out most for me is um, Gretzky, Curry's one-timer and Gretzky with the puck. And it's the same in this era. Now, if we can only get some Stanley Cups in, <laughs> in this era as well. All will be well in this era. Yeah, well, this guy's been a consistent producer, well, uh, for eight years, really. But for the last six years, since getting his 50th in Calgary on the last game of the season, uh, five years ago, the the day that uh, uh, Mark Giordano took down Connor McDavid and ruined his summer, Uh. Leon got his 50th. Uh, So the last six seasons, uh, on the power play, 16, 16, 15 goals, then 24, 32, and now he's back to 20 after a little bit of a slow start this year. 20 used to be the oldest franchise record shared by Wayne Gretzky and Ryan Smith. Wow. And, and Drysdale has obliterated that over the last two years, and here he is again. And here's the other talk about consistently. This is his shooting percentage generally, not the executioner shot. And he's got, I'll just round it, 22, 20, 19, 20, 21, 19 for the last six years. But right. I, I thought a high shooting percentage was unsustainable, Bruce. Yeah, well, we were told that. So usually, it usually is. I mean, Jordan, Ever, <laughs> Jordan Eberle had a percentage like that one year yeah. and got a big contract. And then he immediately fell back to, you know, pretty good, but not, I mean, anything close to 20% is fantastic for shooting percentage in this league. And the goalies stop 90 plus percent of the shots unless they're facing Leon. They only stop 80 percent, you know. It, it usually <laughs> is unsustainable. It usually is. Yeah. Except if, except for guys who score around the net garbage goals. Like I, I bet you Corey Perry mm-hmm. had a high shooting percentage for a long time. I, and I could be, maybe I'm wrong about that. But I, but Dry Gary Curry did. Gary Curry did. And, uh, and, and I remember in those old debates about whether it was sustainable or not, you would often raise uh, the orders mm-hmm. in Gary Curry. And Drysaddle, again, he's that rare player like Curry who um, is choosy on his shots, and when he does shoot it, he is deadly. Yeah, well, this year he's down to 18.8%, so that's why he's only got 40 goals. There you go. Uh, so he's, uh, of course, Curry had seven years in a row over 20%, and then the four of them in the middle were over 25% in a row. That's how deadly the Gretzky to Curry Axis was. So, Bruce, tonight's conundrum. The Oilers are now just three points back of the Vancouver Canucks, 102 to 99. The Oilers have a game in hand on Vancouver. Plus, they play Vancouver next Saturday night. Before then, they play Wednesday night against who? Uh, Vegas. Vegas and Friday night against Arizona. Yep. So the the conundrum is, do they keep the pedal to the metal? Do they keep the pedal to the metal and go all out to get the, try to get the divisional championship, which is within their, like, honestly, it's within their grasp at this point. That, that could happen. The Oilers have a goal differential of plus 56. Only two teams now are higher than the Oilers, um, Dallas and Florida. Vancouver's is plus 53, their goal differential. Um, so, it's 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 an interesting question, you know. Do you know? 
I guess some people would would just say, well, you always go for it. You always just give it your all. And but I don't think the the real world works that way. And um, I think teams, and especially veteran teams, can back off and go into cruise control. And we've seen actually seen that with the Oilers a little bit um, since their winning streak. They've uh, now and then been in cruise control. I think they were kind of in cruise control tonight. And um, they, they're able to win games like this be, because they're just superior to so many teams. What do you think they should do, Bruce? Cruise control or pedal to the metal? Yeah, well, I mean, last night I was on this very podcast arguing cruise control and use, you know, uh, get players rest. Uh, yeah. I still think that's doable and I still think it's a priority. But at the same time, you look at these standings and the Oilers have six left. Vancouver have five left. Uh, and they have one left against each other. If Edmonton were to win out their last six games and specifically beat Vancouver in regulation, it wouldn't matter if they won the other games in, in extra time, gimmick time or not. Uh, but if they have to beat, they would have to beat Vancouver in regulation. And if they did that, Vancouver can't get to what Edmonton would get to, which is what is it, 100? And, and the Oilers are right now at 99 points. So they could get to 111. Vancouver can get to 112. But if they lose to Edmonton in regulation, they can only get to 110. So their destiny is in their own hands. Now, it stands to reason they're, they're not going to win six in a row. But also stands to reason that Vancouver's not going to win all their games either. They got games against Vegas, Arizona, at Edmonton versus Calgary, and then uh, at Winnipeg to close out. So those aren't necessarily gift games. Arizona's playing tough. I mean, Oilers play Arizona twice, so there's uh, nothing nothing guaranteed. But it's, uh, it's now officially up for grabs. And it sure would be nice to grab a division flag for the first time in 37 years. So it is a bit of a bobble, but uh, uh, being rested and raring to go for the playoffs is uh, is a huge priority. So it is a conundrum. So the team that finishes eighth is the, the team that finishes first in the West – Yep. Will face in the the face team that plays Walker. eighth, correct? So that's Dallas. They got 105 points. They're going to be number one. So almost certainly it's going to be. Yeah, let's. I think that's a fairly safe bet. Vancouver has 102. Dallas has 105. You know, it, it's possible. But um, so we still don't know whether that number eight team is going to be Vegas or Nashville. I would just love to see Vegas move over to the other side and have Vegas, Winnipeg, Colorado, and Dallas beating up on each other mm-hmm. over on that side. And then wh- whoever emerges um, has to play the winner of the, the Pacific. I, that's what I'm hoping happens. Um, watch what you wish for. Um, yeah. So that would leave Vancouver, Edmonton, Los Angeles, and Nashville on this side. Mm-hmm. And... Um, yeah, Edmonton against Nashville. If Edmonton was to finish first ahead of Vancouver, Edmonton could play Nashville. Could that'd be an interesting series? I mean, Edmonton seems to have matched matched up pretty well against Nashville in recent years, but Nashville's just been playing lights out hockey. Yep. So uh, you just never know. You never know what's going to happen. Strange things happen in the playoffs. Well, as it stands right now, the Kings are one point ahead of Vegas for third in the West, and Vegas has a game in hand. So that could go either way. Yeah. And it could go either way right down to the end, and that the Oilers could clinch first place on the last game of the season, only to find that the results in other games have them playing. Vegas. You know, Vegas, or uh, it could be Nashville. Well, Nashville and Vegas are tied with each other, right? Either one of them could finish seventh or eighth, or L.A. could be in there. So... All you can do is finish where you finish. I mean, the one bobble for finishing first in your division is you have home ice advantage for first two rounds. Yes. Of the playoffs. So, and so yeah. What I think should happen, Bruce, is they, they have these two games before they play Vancouver. The yep. game against Vancouver, I think, essentially 
decides it. Although you never know, but you know, it's a huge game next Saturday. If the Oilers win, th- then there's maybe a bit more impetus to, you know, if they're in a position then where they're actually a couple points ahead of Vancouver by then, um, or a point ahead of Vancouver. And it gets tough, but really, I, I, I think the, f- I think fundamentally the key is to be rested and healthy going into the playoffs. Like when Hyman got that Bouchard shot off his foot tonight, that was the worst. That was the scariest moment of the game by far. Yes. That was, you know, that's like oh, seriously, uh-huh. and it still is scary. Who knows how his foot is? So, um, yeah. if you can sit him out, like if you know, if, if, for instance, like let's let's say his foot's that has got to hurt like hell, and and it's mm-hmm. still, I'm sure it still hurts like hell. And if he could sit out a game or two, you know, that kind of thing. Have McDavid sit out a game. Have Drive Settle sit out a game. I'm totally on with that. And I know that. A lot of Oilers fans would hate, will hate to hear that, but that's how that's how I see it, and I think that's more important than winning the division. Um, I think you can, if it's there, yeah, battle for it. But the most important yeah. thing is to rest, be rested heading into the playoffs. And this crazy schedule with five games in seven days—is that what it is? Yep. Five games in seven days, like that's in, in the last week of the season. Give those guys a rest in one of those games. You can't play that many games. You just, all the good players should be sitting out at least one of those games. So they just play four and seven. That's what, I, that's yeah. how I see it. No, that's that's my take as well. Uh, and of course, just because you have a guy sitting out, doesn't mean you can't try and win that game. Yeah. Uh, and you have, you know, you have three games, two against Arizona and one against uh, San Jose, where you might not need your hundred and hundred percent uh you know top 20 players to beat them but you, you know you still have to look after details but uh, any game if they're sitting one of their stars you know that that will uh you know take them down a notch but in yeah. a way uh, i think you mentioned last night it's almost like the preseason. you have you know five games on the calendar well nobody's going to play all five you're going to have guys playing two and three and four of those games um, and they do have the roster flexibility now that they can, uh, there's a few different ways they can approach it. So I'm still going to write about it tomorrow, but this tantalizing, you know, with Vancouver losing at LA tonight, and by the way, with Dallas losing at Chicago tonight in regulation, right? Yeah. <laughs> that uh, even the, the conference crown, you know, if they come down to earth a little bit, Oh, oh they, no. they got 105 points. So it was at what, 99? 99 with a game in hand and the tiebreaker on Edmonton's side. So, Whew. Let's see. Bruce. Couple Dallas losses and it's. Uh, yeah. You know. Well, let's leave it there, Bruce. Thanks, thanks for talking tonight. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.